welcome back. If you're new here, hi baby bird. I'm your non-binary mapa bird now. Welcome to the nest. We're gonna pick up in chapter seven today <clears throat> of adult children of emotionally immature parents. Um, thank you so much for coming back, following along, and joining here just for whatever reason, be it you couldn't get a hold of the book, don't really want to buy the book, you process things better when you're listening versus when you're actually reading, so <clears throat> any of the above. Glad you could tune in. Here we go. <clears throat> Breaking down and awakening. This chapter describes what it's like for people to wake up from an ill-fitting role they've been playing for too long. This awakening stage often starts with a sense of failure or loss of control. Painful symptoms like depression, anxiety, chronic tension or not sleeping can all be signals that old strategies to rewrite reality have become unsustainable. These psychological and physical symptoms are a warning system telling us that we need to get back in sync with who we are and how we really feel. What is the true self? The concept of the true self goes all the way back to ancient times when the idea of having a soul first arose. Human beings have always felt the presence of a genuine inner self that sees and experiences everything but stands a little apart from what we do in the outside world. This self is the source of our unique individuality and is unaffected by the family pressures that mold our role selves. This inner self can be most known from, by many names, such as the true self, the real self, the core self, but all are the same thing. The consciousness that speaks the truth at the center of a person's being. You can think of the true self as an extremely accurate, self-informing neurological feedback system that points each individual toward optimal energy and functioning. The physical sensations that accompany experiencing the true self suggest that whatever this self is, it's based in our biology as human beings. It's the source of all gut feelings and intuition, including immediate, accurate impressions of other people. <clears throat> we can use fluctuations in the energy of our true selves as a guidance system to tell us when we're in alignment with a life path that fits us well. When we're in accord with our true selves, we see things clearly and feel that we're in a state of flow. We become focused on solutions instead of problems. Things seem much more possible as we pay attention to our genuine needs and desires, opportunities, and people come into our lives that help us in ways we never imagined. We actually become luckier. And when I say that that is so true, bitch, when I tell you that that is so fucking true, the, the, the minute that I really formed and knew who I was, was the day everything changed for the best when things had been so bad. And granted, my life isn't by any stretch of the means fantastical. Let me just make that very, very plain to you. I am leaving this beautiful, magical, wonderful oasis, a room in someone's house that is huge, more than enough room for me. I live here very comfortably and I can't anymore because the job that I had was not remotely sustainable for me in a mental or emotional capacity, which is who we are. It should be more than acceptable that if something mentally and emotionally is deeply disturbing us, we should not do that job. We are emotional first and logical second, and we always have been, and we forever will be. There's no getting around it. So don't work on controlling your emotions and disciplining your mind you need to hone your emotions. 
you need to learn how to hold them, not control them. When you're angry, that is your innermost truest self realizing that you are being mistreated and disrespected and it is not warranted, which is why you are angry. And you of all people know when you've messed up. You know when you've colossally and royally messed up. Because people like us usually take accountability because our parents are incapable of doing it. So when things mess with you emotionally and you very much know that you don't deserve it, you gotta get away from it. You gotta separate yourself. But I'll tell you what, people have become so much more inclined to want to listen to me, to want to help me, to want to do whatever they can to be there for me because I'm me. I'm not trying to mold myself into being anything you want or need. I don't have any business doing that and neither do you. You are supposed to be yourself and the right people that want someone like you in their lives will be attracted and the ones that do not won't be. So if they don't text you back, that means they're not supposed to be in your life. If it matters to you to be in consistent communication and they don't want to, they're not supposed to be in your life. They're just not. And there are lots of people where you can pick up where you left off and that's great. That is great. And if that's the way you like to live your relationships, then guess what? The right people are gonna get right in sync with that. Go figure. The people that are meant to be in your life will be attracted to who you are, not to what you become for them. The people that are attracted to what you become for them are abusive. They don't like or love you. They like what you can do for them. You're not a door, you're not a doormat. You're not someone who's just here to be used up for someone else's convenience. Come on. Like get a grip. Like I love you. I say this with love. I say this with Amapa's love. Get a grip. Get your shit together because how dare you think that way? about yourself. You're just a receptacle. You're just here for other people's convenience. I think the fuck not. You were forced to be here. You've been made to exist. Don't you dare waste your breath being something else for everyone else. You're entitled to your own fucking life. Anyone who says otherwise is abusing you, period. Anyone who says that your life is not your own is abusing you, period. I don't care if you've been married to the person for 15 years. Anybody who considers your life a mere stepping stone to what they need to do in their life to get done, to do whatever it is that they wanna do, is abusive. And you don't deserve that type of treatment, no one does. Not a child, not a teenager, not an adult, no human or or being that is alive deserves to be used up like that. And if today's the day that you realize it, congratulations. There's no judgment here. It's not like you should have known all along. How would you know? If you were being raised to be used, how would you know? If no one let you in on that little secret, I'm glad to be here to enlighten you. No one let me in on it for 25 years. My whole life I was used as a caregiver, as a therapist, as a harm receptacle, as a sex receptacle. I was used and abused for years and years and years. I didn't know until I got out of those situations, how bad they actually were. That's what happens when you're consistently traumatized. You just don't know what you're really going through because your brain won't allow you to process it because it's too painful. <clears throat> I'm frankly very thankful. My brain is incredibly powerful. And I only know that because of 
how we've been slowly reviewing back my life. And I realized the things that I survived were very significant and I survived them. I didn't just make it through or push through or have a magical fairy appear to give me strength. I did it all by myself. I did it all by myself. I even figured out I was autistic by myself. And I had to, I had to get everything that I've ever done, everything positive that's ever happened to me <laughs> is because of me. Not because someone decided to come in and save the day. Every good thing that ever happened to me was exactly what I deserved. And I worked and I found my way. I didn't work my way. I found my way there. But it was because I'm genuinely me and I'm unapologetic about it. The sooner you tap into who you really fucking are, the more, the more respect and the more power you will receive. The only people who will disrespect you are people who maybe are a little bit ahead of you in life and are insecure that you're gonna pass them up. The only people who treat you like shit are the people who are projecting about how awful they feel on the inside. It is genuinely true. I know you don't wanna believe it. I know you wanna think that they're just bullying you because that's what you deserve and you're an ugly piece of garbage and no one loves you, but that's false. And frankly, beneath you to think that way about yourself. There's no reason you should hate yourself that much. The only way that you do is because people taught you to. Why would they teach somebody to be that way? What loving parent would ever want their child to be that fucking insecure? They didn't deserve that. They didn't deserve it. And neither did you. So what does the true self want? Your true self has the same needs as a flourishing, healthy child to grow, to be known, and to express itself. Above all, your true self keeps pushing for your expansion as if your self-actualization were the most important thing on this earth. To this end, it asks for your acceptance of its guidance and legitimate desires. It has no interest in whatever desperate ideas you came up with in childhood regarding a healing fantasy or a role self. It only wants to be genuine with other people and sincere in its own pursuits. Children stay in alignment with their true self if, it, if the important adults in their lives support doing so. However, when they are criticized or shamed, they learn to feel embarrassed by their true desires. By pretending to be what their parents want, children think they've found the way to win their parents' love. They silence their true selves and instead follow the guidance of their role selves and fantasies. In the process, they lose touch with their inner and outer reality. <sighs> Here's an exercise to awaken your true self. Whether you're an internalizer or an externalizer, if you've been asleep to your deepest needs, your true self will use emotional symptoms to wake you up so you can start taking care of yourself. Your true self wants you to have the peace of living in accordance with reality. The trick is to recognize these signs of distress for the life savers they are. This exercise will help you become more conscious of your true self. You'll need a piece of paper and a pen Fold the piece of paper lengthwise down the middle. That way you can just see one half of the page at a time. And write a heading on each half. My true self and my role self. First, orient the paper so you see the half with the heading of my true self. Think back to yourself as a child. Go deep and be honest. Be fucking honest, girl. Be honest. Ain't nobody in that room but you. Ain't nobody writing these thoughts but you. So just do it, okay? Stop lying to yourself. Don't give the answer you'd give a stranger. Don't give the answer you'd give your mom. Give the answer that is true. It will pop up immediately and it will make you feel something. <clears throat> what were you like 
before you started trying to be someone else. Before you learned to judge and criticize yourself, what did you enjoy doing? What made you feel good? If you could be the person you really are and didn't have to worry about money, what would your life be like right now? I personally recommend looking back to who you were before the fourth grade. What were your interests? Who were your favorite people and what did you like about them the most? If you had free time, what did you like to do? How did you play? What was your idea of a perfect day? What really raised your energy? Write down your thoughts about this in no particular order as they come to you beneath the heading of my true self. And here's, here's the tea. If you were raised like me and you were a caregiver from as soon as you could walk and talk on your own, so like four or five, this particular exercise is gonna be extremely tough because you're gonna think, I don't know. I don't know. I've never lived my life as not for someone else. So with that, instead of fourth grade, if you were already changed and turned into a caregiver by then, think back to when you were four and five, if you can, if it's not blacked out. If it's blacked out, take a deep breath and know that it's for good reason, okay? Your brain doesn't block out things for no reason. So right now is not the time for you to process that. And I know you might get impatient. Oh, I know you might want to figure it out now so you can just be healed already. It doesn't work like that. Your brain is saving you a lot of emotional labor right now. And it's for good fucking reason. So you need to listen to it. I unfortunately didn't get to tap into those young, young memories until I was in my 30s because it just, everything would have been way too triggering in my 20s to do it. It would have sent me over more often. And I already had dealt with, um, with two life attempts uh, in my 20s. So, you know, I can't imagine well, I can actually, I can perfectly imagine what would have happened if I had to deal with those repressed memories back then. And I'm thankful that my brain and my body was able to wait it out and really understand where I was at in an emotional way um, before I figured a lot of other things out. So if this exercise can't pertain to you right now, that is okay. That's okay. But I do want you to save it. So either open your notes app and write down the prompt for later or put it in your journal. If you're, if you're journaling, good, go for it. I can't journal anymore. It's too triggering, unfortunately, because multiple times throughout my life, someone would find my diary and read it to themselves or read it to other people or tell me and quote it exactly as they read it, especially if it was a complaint or a criticism about them in my personal diary. No matter how many locks, chains, codes, and keys I had, they always managed to break in. So it became completely unsafe for me to ever jot down my real thoughts and feelings into a book or into anything. So <clears throat> if you're like me, I suggest your notes app. Apparently you are allowed to lock them now and assign a pin to them. So, you know, just don't be stupid with your pin. Don't use your fucking birthday. Use something significant, but not somebody's birthday. It's always someone's birthday that you end up using. Don't do that. Every human does that. Be unique. Okay. When you finish that list, flip the paper over to the other half with your role self and contemplate who you had to become in order to feel admired and loved. Are you now involved in things that you aren't really interested in? What do you make yourself do because you think it means you're a good person? Are there people who you are involved with that deplete your energy and make you feel entirely drained? 
What are you spending time on that bores you? How would you describe the social role that you try to play? And how do you help others see you? Which of your personality traits do you try to cover up? What are you glad no one knows about you? That's a big one. The things that you don't want people to know about you, that's significant. Now, when it comes to like kinks and fetish, that's for your therapist and you to figure out, bestie. But I'm just saying like regular things, like life things, nothing when it comes to sex, just life things, okay? That's where you need to be traveling right now. That's what we need to be focusing on, okay? Hey, look, I don't kink shame, but you, you gotta figure those out. But also, that's not what we're talking about. <clears throat> When you finish, put the piece of paper away for a day. Just put it away. Don't make any edits, nothing. Um, and then the next day, open it up, smooth it down the middle, and then compare the two sides. Are you primarily living in your truest form or are you living in your role self? Are you letting that dominate your life? It's a really good way to figure it out. <clears throat> Breaking down in order to wake up. People experience a breakdown when the pain of living in role selves and healing fantasies begin to outweigh any potential benefit. Most psychological growth exposes some distressing truths about what we've been doing with our lives. Psychotherapy and the like are aids to help us become aware of truths we already know in our bones. So when you're going through a breakdown, a good question to ask is what is actually breaking down? We usually think it's ourself, but what's typically happening is that our struggle to deny our emotional truth is breaking down. The emotional distress is a signal that it's getting harder to remain emotionally unconscious. It means we're about to discover our true selves underneath all that story business. Your truest self wants you to, to see what's really going on. It tries to wake you up because it wants you to stop believing that your emotionally immature parents knew what was best for you and that creating a role self is better than being who you really are. It, show, it knows better than to let a fantasy run your life. Which is why people who live in delusion eventually actually lose their minds. A delusion is not healthy. People who live like that are not mentally healthy. They're not stable. It's a fantasy, which is why they're losing their minds and why they sound like they're losing their minds. It's because they are. <laughs> Developmental psychologist Jean Paget observed that in order for people to learn anything new, their old mental pattern must break up and rework itself around a new incoming knowledge. The process of internal breakdown and accommodation is key to continuing intellectual development. Otherwise, Polish psychiatrist Kazimierz Stabrowski theorized that emotional distress is potentially a sign of growth, not necessarily illness. He saw psychological symptoms as coming from a freshly activated urge to grow and coined the term positive disintegration to describe times when people break down inside in order to reorganize into more emotionally complex beings. The Browski noticed that some people who were able to expand their personalities as a result of these upheavals while others soon slipped back to where they'd been before. He observed that psychologically unaware people weren't likely to change much after an emotional upheaval. Other people, however, seem to take periods of distress as opportunities to learn about themselves, meeting challenging emotional conditions with curiosity and a desire to learn from them. Dabrowski felt that these people had a developmental potential that pushed them toward becoming more competent and autonomous. Dabrowski believed that individuals who can tolerate negative emotions tend to have the highest developmental potential and saw negative emotions as the driving force behind much of human psychological development. Since the discomfort these feelings can cause, uh, since the discomfort these feelings cause can motivate ambitious people to find solutions. There we go. Switch the words. 
Instead of shutting down or getting defensive when faced with difficult experiences, people with developmental potential try to discover a deeper understanding about themselves and reality. To this end, they're willing to engage in self-reflection, even if this entails painful self-doubt. Although the uncertainty inherent in this process of self-examination can create the byproducts of anxiety, guilt, or depression, tackling these deep questions ultimately yields a stronger, more adaptive personality. Eileen's story. My client Eileen found support and validation in Dabrowski's ideas. An insightful woman, she had benefited greatly from psychotherapy over the years. Her love of learning made her want to understand herself and other people, but her family saw that kind of psychological interest as a sign of maladjustment. When Eileen sought therapy for after a very destructive love affair, her family thought she was being ridiculous and labeled her as the sick one. Rather than seeing that Eileen was using her emotional pain as a tool for growth and self-understanding, they wondered why she was wasting so much time and money rehashing the past. Eileen knew she was going and doing the right thing by coming to therapy, but worried that maybe she was the sick one in the family. At one level, she knew better based on her awareness of her parents' immaturity, impulsivity, and avoidance of emotional intimacy. But it still seemed odd to her that she was the only family member who felt the need for help. Learning about Dabrowski's idea of positive disintegration helped Eileen to see her distress as growing pains. And once she knew about Dabrowski's growth theory, she felt proud of herself for being the only person in her family willing to explore her distress in order to find a healthier way of being. Waking up from an outdated role self. People often keep playing their childhood role self far into adulthood because they believe it keeps them safe and is the only way to be accepted. But when the true self has had enough of the role playing, people often get a wake up call in the form of unexpected emotional symptoms. Virginia's wake up call came in the form of a sudden onset of uh, panic attacks that occurred when she felt criticized by her tyrannical and judgmental older brother, Brian. Virginia had always worried constantly about what people thought of her, so much so that social events were exhausting triathlons of reading other people, trying not to give offense, and imagining imminent rejection. At work, she miserably obsessed over how people saw her. Virginia came to therapy to get a grip on her panic, and did, but she also ended up realizing how unaccepted she felt as a child. Through therapy, Virginia realized that Brian had the same disapproving manner as their deceased father who had always left Virginia feeling inept and unloved. She began to understand that her social anxiety was a reflection of her childhood role in which she repeatedly, <coughs> excuse me, and unsuccessfully tried to win the love of her critical and disdainful father. Her subconscious healing fantasy was that one day she would finally be correct enough to gain his approval. She had unconsciously taken on the role of playing the scared, inadequate child to her father's wise and powerful persona. And now Brian was his stand-in. Virginia's anxiety attacks signaled that she was beginning to question her childhood belief that the authority figure is always right. She told me, if people expressed any displeasure with me, especially men, I got frightened and automatically assumed I must be wrong. Now she was able to see her relationship with Brian more clearly. I've been putting him on a pedestal like he's some kind of God. He doesn't care about me, yet I let him determine whether I felt good or not. I've always been so concerned about his opinion, but now I'm getting a bit more self-contained. I feel as if I'm just learning to be an individual. Without the wake-up call of her panic attacks, Virginia might have just kept on deferring to others in a cloud of self-deprecating anxiety. Her panic attacks ushered in a new consciousness in which she no longer needed to accept the role in, in which she no longer needed to accept the story of male infallibility 
she'd been indoctrinated with as a child. A story that had been destroying her self-esteem as an adult woman. Her role self of being the weak and confused little girl collapsed as she realized that she could choose whether she wanted contact with Brian or not. She could finally be aware of how she really felt about her father and brother who jointly made her the least important member of the family. And the spell was broken. <clears throat> Waking up to what you really feel. Sometimes giving up a healing fantasy of how we will finally win love means we have to face unwanted feelings about people close to us. Many of us tend to feel guilty and ashamed for feelings that we deem to be unacceptable. We're convinced that the only way to be a good person is to repress these feelings. However, if we quash our real feelings for too long, they may just bubble up in ways that force us to stop and look at what's wrong. Tilda had so much to feel grateful for that she couldn't stop feeling guilty. She'd been born to a single mother who did domestic work to support them both. Her mother, Kaja, had come to the United States from Sweden to make her a better life and for her child. She scraped together every cent that she could earn so that Tilda could get to good education. Tilda had taken full advantage of her opportunities and eventually earned an advanced degree in graphic design. She was nearing the end of her training when she came to see me for an episode of major depression. Although she was still able to work, every morning began with a struggle to take action. As soon as she got out of bed, she just longed to crawl back under the covers. <clears throat> we traced the onset of her depression to phone calls to her mother, who was becoming increasingly petulant and bitter as Tilda neared completion of her studies. Kaja had always been emotional and never let Tilda forget how she single-handedly raised her after being abandoned by Tilda's father and coming to the United States. In every conversation, Kasha complained about physical ailments and people who had recently done her wrong. Tilda was sympathetic, and besides, she felt she owed her mother everything, but the strain of listening helplessly to Kasha's angry miser misery was wearing her down. Tilda felt that nothing she said to her mother ever seemed to help. I asked Tilda how she felt when Kasha brushed, brushed off her sympathy and continued with her complaints. <clears throat> At first, Tilda would only say how guilty she felt for not being able to make her mother feel better and what a bad daughter she was for enjoying her life as Kaja suffered. But when I persisted and asked how it felt in her body when she heard her mother's voice, Tilda let herself feel it. She looked stunned as she identified the feeling. I don't like her, she said in a whisper. This was Tilda's emotional truth, which had been at war with her childhood healing fantasy of finally giving Kasha enough love to make up for her disappointing life. Tilda's exaggerated guilt and gratitude had prevented her from experiencing her real emotions about her mother. The ironclad family story was that Kasha had sacrificed everything and therefore deserved Tilda's total attention and devotion. When Tilda began to resent her mother's ceaseless complaining, her guilt turned her own unacknowledged anger into depression. Tilda's depression lifted as soon as she accepted her genuine feelings towards Kasha. Finally allowing herself to know that she didn't like her mother, even though she was grateful to her, released her from an impossible bind. She realized that she could still have contact with her mother but she didn't have to pretend to feel the right way. <coughs> Waking up to anger. Because anger is an expression of individuality, it's the emotion that emotionally immature parents most often will punish their children for having. But anger can be a helpful emotion because it gives people energy to do things differently and lets them see themselves as worthy of sticking up for. It's often a good sign when overly responsible, anxious, or depressed people begin to be consciously aware of feeling angry. It indicates that their true self is coming to the forefront 
and that they're beginning to care about themselves. Jade used to feel bad about herself for feeling angry so often, especially because her anger was often directed toward her parents. For years, she thought the answer was to pretend just to not have those feelings. Secretly, Jade worried that she was a malcontent who got irritated for no good reason. But her anger seemed to have its roots in her now, and um, it was rooted specifically in her dismissive and emotionally unengaged parents who would ignore her feelings. <clears throat> when Jade finally started thinking about her anger in terms of her emotional needs being neglected, she was able to see it differently. Now I think there would be something wrong with me if I weren't angry. There are plenty of reasons why I'm angry and my anger is coming right from my core self. It's very empowering to be angry. I don't wanna live a lie anymore. It's been lonely and disappointing trying to relate to my parents. Being with them is isolating. After accepting her anger, Jade could see her healing fantasy clearly for the first time. She had thought she could heal her family by being extremely loving. And this is the way she put it. I tried to see everybody as good. I thought everyone loved one another. I was naive. I thought that if you were nice to people, at the end of the day, things would get fixed. I thought that my parents would actually love me and that my brother and sister might care about what I'm interested in. Now I've learned that I need to do what's right for me and just trust myself. I really do enjoy my own company. I don't wanna waste my time anymore. I hope I'll find people I can trust. I'm not going to try and make it work with people who are distant or unsupportive. I'll be cordial and polite and all, but I'm not moving in close just to be disappointed. That is honestly exactly how I used to feel and think. I used to think for sure that everybody at the end of the day had a good heart and had good intentions. And that is both naivety, uh, like being raised in abuse, but also it's like an autistic thing. We, we have a, a tendency to be a little more naive than the rest, um, not because we're stupid, but just because we have an internalized deep sense of justice, like our core self, I think, I think autism and genetics, it has to be some type of thing where like your true self will not be suppressed. Like ultimately in a human, that's just the truth of it is that like your true self will eventually find its way out. Um, <clears throat> but with autistic people, it seems to be more prevalent than anything. Than anything it was more important to me to figure out who i am and what i loved most about me and life than it was about anything else a career aspiration owning a home falling in love any of that it became immediately unimportant the second i i started figuring out like i don't know myself at all i don't know myself at all because i allowed everyone else to tell me who i was because it was just easier. They would just shut up, finally, if I just stopped fighting them. Because <laughs> I was just surrounded by people who hated me. They hated who I was. It was very clear. Because you don't fight someone that often and try to change their mind that deeply and, and do everything in your fucking power to make them feel useless and guilty for wanting to be themselves unless you have another agenda. And that is that you hate the person that they are and you wanna brainwash them and remold them into being exactly who you want them to be. Which is weird. It's weird. <laughs> it's just weird behavior. <laughs> like why? I, I, I can't understand the people who love all being the same. Like I know we're human, so we're naturally going to have like a lot in, there's going to be different sectors of us that are going to have a lot in common. Like, I don't personally believe that I've ever had an original thought or experience because somewhere in the world, someone else had a life that was 98% like mine. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's still just like, it's really eye opening when you realize that not everybody has good intentions and that you shouldn't go about life believing that because it doesn't, it doesn't put as much of a positive spin on your life as you might think. That's why I like toxic positive, positivity disgusts me. 
Like you can't go around believing that everyone has your best intentions at heart because they don't. They have their best intentions at heart. <laughs> Everybody's the main character in their own story, including you. Including you, bitch. So like you probably have good intentions for others because you never experienced it yourself, but that doesn't mean that you need to let yourself be wide open and and susceptible to people who are gonna try and deceive you. Because people are tricky, they're ornery. So, take that for what it is. <clears throat> Waking up to better self-care. Internalizers are notorious for not taking good care of themselves. <coughs> believing it's up to them to improve or fix everything, they often end up neglecting their own health, especially the need for rest. As they work to attend to everything they think they need to do, they often overlook even basic physical cues, including pain and fatigue. Lena lived a very pressured life in spite her best efforts to keep things simple. She always felt like she was running out of time. It was as though there was a voice in her head that constantly told her to keep pushing herself and that her efforts were never adequate. Even pleasurable activities like playing the piano became marathons in which she had to overcome laziness and do her best. She never gave herself a break until she was entirely spent. In addition to working feverishly at her full-time job, her life was dictated by the demands she constantly perceived from others down to her pets and the birds that she'd feed in her yard. A drooping plant could fill her with guilt for not watering it sooner. When Lena took an exercise class to help her relax, she wore herself out trying to keep up and do everything perfectly. During the class, she told herself, I should be able to do this. This is baby stuff. The next morning, she woke up unable to think or function very well, but didn't realize that she'd overdone it until she tried to go up some steps, at which point she found that she was so sore that she could hardly lift her legs. That is so true. That is so true. That is exactly what I would do. Lena had a long-standing habit promoted by her demanding mother if ignoring her body's cues, of ignoring her body's cues about fatigue. Mm -hmm. As a child, if she didn't get things done fast enough or work hard enough, her mother chastised her for being lazy. As a result, she had never done things at her own pace and was insensitive to her own physical limits. Lena had been trained to believe that being a good person meant straining to achieve, even if that meant always being a little off balance and never quite ready. In Lena's quest for her mother's approval and love, she had developed the belief that she was only worth something when she was really trying hard. Her childhood healing fantasy was that one day she would try so hard that her mother would be transformed from perennially dissatisfying from a per perennially dissatisfied taskmaster, Ooh, that's a lot of words, that's a lot of consonants, <clears throat> uh, into an appreciative parent who recognized how hard her daughter was working to please her. Lena's all-out efforts were also encouraged by society in general through cultural maxims like try your hardest, never give up, or always do your best. For an overly motivated person like Lena, such messages are mind poison. It's unnecessarily exhausting to always try your best. It's more sensible to know when to do your very best and when not to. Fortunately, once Lena realized that her healing fantasy, what her healing fantasy was doing to her, she was able to reset her values and take her own needs into account. <clears throat> Waking up through relationship breakdowns. Relationship problems present a huge opportunity to wake up. Given that we tend to play out painful patterns learned in childhood in our significant adult relationships, it isn't surprising that so many people come for therapy because of relationship issues. And because intimate adult relationships are so emotionally arousing, they tend to activate unresolved issues about not getting our emotional needs met. We often project issues about our parents onto our partners <clears throat> then we may become even more angry with them because at an unconscious level, they remind us of the past in addition to whatever is happening in the present. <clears throat> this is Mike's story. Mike had recently hit rock bottom after cutbacks in his work hours and a divorce that left him nearly penniless. 
his life had been entirely about being a success in the eyes of other people, especially his wife and mother. Now, his wife and his mother, they're not the same person. <laughs> now in therapy, he was working hard to identify values more in keeping with his true self. In the process, he was beginning to appreciate himself for who he was, including his unique strengths and talents. As Mike reflected on his past, he said, I didn't make decisions based on how I felt. I made decisions based on what other people wanted. I've been doing this for 35 years, including enduring a loveless marriage, and I have nothing to show for it. But maybe I wanted my recent problems to happen. Maybe I was hoping things would crumble. I've been beaten up, torn down, and humiliated, and now I'm about to be laid off, but I'm telling you, I am happy. In spite of his material losses and disappointments, Mike could often Mike could finally, I am having the weirdest form of dyslexia today. Mike could finally drop the healing fantasy that he would be loved if he took care of everyone else at his own expense. The enormous financial debt he incurred due to his divorce was a fitting metaphor for what it had cost him to be someone he wasn't for so many years. Realizing how desperate he had been to be accepted by others, Mike said, I didn't think I was as good as other people. And then he looked at me smiled and asked, so how to define a successful person? Answering his own question, he said, I guess, first of all, you get rid of success and then you see who you are as a person. Waking up from idealizing others. Pay attention, especially if you have a lot of parasocial relationships, okay? One of the hardest fantasies to wake up from is the belief that our parents are wiser and know more than we do. It can be embarrassing and even scary for children to see their parents' weaknesses. And even as adults, people may strongly resist seeing their parents' immaturity for what it is. It can feel better to remain naive about their limitations than to look at them objectively. Subconsciously, perhaps we feel protective of our parents' vulnerability. <clears throat> My client Patsy was clearly more emotionally mature than either her impulsive husband or her petulant mother who lived with her. However, Patsy recoiled when I observed that she seemed to be the most mature person in her family. Oh, I don't like to think that, she objected. She said such a thought felt disloyal and that she didn't think of herself as special or superior in any way. Although humility can be a nice quality, it really wasn't doing Patsy any favors because she was using it to ignore a glaring reality. Idealizing her mother and husband was not helping her, nor was denying her own strengths. Once Patsy was able to accept that she had more maturity than her husband or mother, she could be more objective about their behaviors. She stopped attributing positive qualities to them that they didn't have and was able to set limits with them. She also stopped wasting energy pretending she was less than. She actually was so that they could pretend to be more than they were. And when I say like if you have parasocial relationships, when you idealize and idolize as well, because those are two different things, but they go, they're under this umbrella if you idolize someone, you're not going to see them for who they actually are. And I know for a lot of us, the fantasy of someone is better than the actual person, but I really need you to pay attention to that because even Jenna Marbles has made mistakes, okay? She's not perfect. She's great, but she's not perfect. None of us are. The people that you idolize are not people you need to be focusing how to live your life around or using them as a as a format and way to live life period you have to live the way that is best for your truest self because your life you won't be happy otherwise you you literally will never be fulfilled until you just do what you're passionate about and live how you need to live and surround yourself with people who make you feel happy and excited to be alive celebrities and the rich and famous people and people on your camera and people in your phone they're cool yeah it's nice to get a little window a little peek into who they are sometimes but 
at the end of it, you can't live exactly like someone else just because you want to look like them or just because you want a piece of the life that they're showing you. It's never going to fulfill you the way it might fulfill that person. You have to look for the things that are going to actually fulfill you and make you feel good about yourself. Waking up to your strengths. It's important for people to consciously appreciate their strengths. Unfortunately, the children of emotionally immature parents usually don't develop much appreciation for their positive qualities because self-involved parents have little or no ability to reflect their, child's, their, their child's strengths. As a result, these children often feel a little embarrassed to think of themselves in terms of their most positive qualities. They're accustomed to putting others in the limelight and worry that they'll get a swelled head if they recognize their own strengths. <laughs> However, it's crucial to know what your assets are and be able to articulate that. It provides self-validation and allows you to feel good about what you bring to the world. This self-recognition builds energy and positivity. While modesty and humility can help you keep things in perspective, they shouldn't prevent you from knowing your best qualities. Family therapist and social worker Michael White developed a form of psychotherapy known as narrative therapy in 2007. His approach was founded on the idea that it's crucial for people to become conscious of the meaning and intentions in the storylines that they've been living by. In the process of uncovering a client's life story, the therapist works to expose the often self-neglectful values people have been living by and then invites them to update their guiding principles, choosing new values more consciously. Aaron was a strong, silent type who had always lived by a code that involved not pushing for recognition. Growing up, he loved theater and acting, but never spoke up to request a, a role or ask a director for a bigger part. He thought he would seem spoiled and demanding if he promoted himself, and that lobbying for himself was a sign of weakness. However, as an adult, Aaron began to see that his code of not speaking up for himself often resulted in other people being put ahead of him. In addition, others often took advantage of his talents without reciprocating. He saw that his healing fantasy in which he hoped authority figures would just spontaneously recognize his potential wasn't coming to fruition. So he decided to develop a new value of going after what he wanted. He started actively seeking opportunities and laying claim to them. Considering a job change, he said, in the past, I would have been reluctant to do this for myself, but now I'm not. He finally saw himself as worthy of standing up for and being invested in. Waking up by getting free of childhood issues. Working through childhood emotional injuries is the most effective way of waking up from repeating the past. When I say working through, I mean the mental and emotional process of coming to grips with painful realities. Think of it as a process of breaking down something that's initially too big to swallow. You chew on it until it can become a digestible part of your history. Research suggests that what has happened to people matters less than whether they've processed what happened to them. In a study of the characteristics of parents who raise securely attached children, researchers found that parents who created a secure attachment for their children were often characterized by a willingness to recall and talk about their own childhoods. Even though some of these parents had lived through very difficult childhood experiences themselves, their relationships with their own children were secure since they had spent time thinking about and integrating their childhood experiences and were at ease with both the negative and the positive aspects of their pasts. It's easy to imagine why children with such parents showed secure attachment. These parents were not avoiding reality. Because they had addressed their own pasts, they were fully available to connect with their children and form a secure attachment. In summary, the true self will always find ways to express itself, even in the face of efforts to play a role or live out a healing fantasy. When people have ignored their true self for too long, 
they may develop psychological symptoms. Waking up to the needs of the true self can initially feel like breaking down or hitting bottom. Panic, anger, and depression are just a few symptoms that may signal an emotional awakening to better self-care and healthier values. When people process their childhood issues and wake up to their strengths, they gain the confidence to start living from their true self. In the next chapter, we'll explore how you can use this new objectivity and self-awareness to interact with emotionally immature family members in a new way. All right, I hope that was helpful. Hope it was powerful. Hope it taught you a lot. And I'll see you back for the next chapter.